Hello, welcome to the next in our series of videos on IFRS 9 for Corporates. I'm Sandra Thompson, I lead our Global Accounting Technical Team for Financial Instruments. I'm here today with Felix Woodman, who you've seen on some of our earlier videos. He's on comments to our UK team from the Netherlands, and he's been helping our clients as they implement IFRS 9. Today we're going to carry on talking about hedge accounting. We're in particular going to look at the ability in IFRS 9 to hedge components of non-financial items. We think this will be particularly useful to companies who hedge commodity risk components. Now here, I know this is generally regarded as good news, but can you tell us a bit more and why? It is considered as good news, um, especially for companies who are hedging commodity risk components of, uh, for example, purchases. Um, IS39 has never allowed you to separate out the commodity risk component of such a purchase. So if you take an example, let's say we're hedging aluminum can purchases. Uh, IS39 requires us to compare the full price of the can to whatever derivative we've taken to hedge. So an aluminum can will be dependent, of course, on the price of aluminum, but also on profit margins, conversion costs, and maybe some other spreads for quality of the aluminum. Uh, a purchaser would typically only be able to hedge with an aluminium derivative. So doing the effectiveness test on the total of the can and the aluminium derivative, all the other elements will create some ineffectiveness. Now IFRS 9 allows you to separate out the aluminium component of all the purchase of the can, and therefore the effectiveness test would be between the aluminium derivative and that aluminium component, and would be more effective. Thanks, Geert. So I guess now you're comparing your aluminium component, as you say, to the aluminium derivative and you'll get a much better match. Are there any constraints on when you can use this ability to designate a component? Yes, the standard only allows a component to be separated if the component is separately identifiable and reliably measurable. Sandra, could you tell us what separately identifiable really means? Yes, of course. I think the first thing to bear in mind is that if what you're trying to hedge is physically a component, then it probably is separately identifiable. So the example of the aluminium in the aluminium can is a good one. The aluminium is physically present in the can, so it's almost certainly separately identifiable. However, we don't think that being physically present is enough on its own. So if I take another example, let's suppose we have a company that's selling woolen jumpers. Take two kinds of jumpers. The first is a fairly cheap unbranded jumper. There, the wool is likely to be a separately identifiable component that significantly drives the price. You can compare that to a branded jumper, where most of the price is probably due to the branding and the style, and the woolen component might not be separately identifiable in that price. However, we don't think it's always necessary that the component is physically present. For example, some contracts for liquid natural gas, or LNG, you can see crude oil as a component of the pricing there, even though the crude oil is not actually physically present in the LNG itself. So that's separately identifiable. Yet you mentioned a second condition about reliably measurable. What does that mean? Yeah, reliably measurable. The standard says a component is only reliably measurable if it has a direct and predictable impact on the full item. So take the wooden jumper, for example. If the cheap one, if the wool price goes up, that price of the jumper will probably go up for an equal amount. And for a branded jumper, the price will probably be driven more by supply and demand, and therefore an increase in the price of the wool component might not lead to an increase in the price, might actually be a decrease because other factors are much more predominantly in driving the price. Thanks, it. And I think what we're finding in practice is that in some cases this can be a very judgmental area. One of the examples actually given in the standard is the ability to hedge the oil component of a jet fuel price. I think when we come to apply that in practice, we realise it's not always easy to identify what the oil component is. In particular, depending on, for example, if you start with heavy oil or light oil, that can give you a different fuel component at the end. So I think our advice here is that this is a judgmental area. There are going to be some significant debates, so don't expect this to be straightforward. So here, let's suppose we do get to an identifiable and reliably measurable component. Does that mean there's never going to be any ineffectiveness in this hedge? Uh, not always. Um, like we said before, uh, you need to be able to identify 
and reliably measure the component. So sometimes the components you can actually identify reliably measure, for example, because it's specified in a contract, might not be a component you can actually take out the derivative on. So that would mean you would have to do some kind of proxy hedging with a with an item which is correlated, but might not be perfectly correlated. So in such an instance, ineffectiveness will still occur. And one final question. Generally, IFRS 9's hedge accounting requirements are prospective. So what do companies do on transition to IFRS 9? You're right. Uh, generally, it is prospective. And on this particularly hedging strategy, clients have always wanted to hedge the component. So you would expect that that's what you would be able to do. However, uh, this has been discussed at the IFRIC, and it's not allowed to go from a I-39 designation into an I-39 designation model within the same hedge relationship. Because you're changing the hedge designation, the IFRIC has said you should treat that as a new hedge relationship, meaning that on the date of transition, you have a choice. You can either continue with your I-39 designation and have ineffectiveness, or if you want to take advantage of uh, separating out this risk component, you need to stop the hedge relationship and start a new one. And I guess that itself could give, give, give rise to some effectiveness because you're starting with an old pre-existing derivative. You're right, that, that will have the, the, the starting value problem and ineffectiveness around that. So just to recap, today we've looked at IFRS 9's ability to designate a, a risk component of a non-financial item. We've seen this can be very useful in practice and can lead to a lot less ineffectiveness. However, in order to do this, you need that risk component to be both separately identifiable and reliably measurable, and that can be a significant area of judgment. And finally, we've touched on what happens when you first adopt IFRS 9, but if you want to use this for an existing hedge, you'll have to de-designate your old hedge and start a new hedge relationship. That's it for today, and I do hope you'll join us next time. Bye-bye.